Um, hello, my name is Benjamin Yoder. Uh, I'm with a website called OneController.com. It consists of just me, so hello. I'm everyone there. Um, it's more or less just a YouTube channel these days. Uh, but it really focuses on like obscure and kind of underappreciated games. It doesn't necessarily have to be import games, but that happens a lot. Um, and so what I found over the years is I run into a lot of scenarios where I have to play some really text-dense Japanese games. Um, just for whatever reason, it, I'm led to that point, and I'm going to do this now, whether I like it or not. Um, so um, I did take like a year of Japanese like seven years ago in college for school stuff. And like, I loved it. It's great. And if you could take Japanese, you totally should. Learning Japanese can be the best way to play these games if you absolutely can. I will, I will stress that heavily. Um, but as time has gone on, I have not kept up with Japanese. So I have f forgotten more and more. Um, however, I have found over time that I have had more and more success with playing games through in Japanese. Um, as I mentioned earlier, speak, you know, actually knowing Japanese is going to give you the best results here. Um, but you can get like different levels of appreciations for a game, whether that be the game's mechanics, stories, characters, things like that. So I'm going to be covering like how I kind of approach those today, what kind of strategies I take in terms of um, you know like using you know things in the game itself to kind of give me information about what I should be doing, um, using resources outside of the game, um, and then also what kind of tools you can use um, to actually um, you know uh, help you you know get more out of either the resources you're working with or the game itself. Um, first thing I do want to talk about a little bit is just kind of ask, you know, why would you need to do this today? Like, one of the great things about today is we're, we're not at a point where a lot of Japanese games are getting left overseas anymore. Like, it, it, Tales of games are not, every other Tales of game is not being left in Japan. Um, so we have a really consistent uh, release of Japanese games coming out day and date in the U.S. usually. And even, like, Dojin games and indie games from Japan you can find on Steam and things like that. So there's a lot of, like, a really broad scope for that. However, I do want to talk about kind of four categories of games that I continue to run into this issue where I'll need to actually you know, sit down and try to play them. Um, I think one of the most obvious is uh, you know, retro games. Um, you know, while today, Japanese games are pretty easy to, to, to you know, find in, in, in English and everything, um, retro games you have with systems like the TurboGrafx, uh, PlayStation, PS2, Nintendo Wii, there are pretty large chunks of their library that are left overseas, and, and, and a lot of really good games um, that you, you just can't um, um, access without you know, actually sitting down and, and, and trying to, to play them in their original language. So a random game I threw up here was just Velda Salaba. It's like a random PS1 game. It's like a flight sim game. Really cool art aesthetic and things, but there's really thousands and thousands of these games. And because of the immense history of games being left over overseas, you know, not every game is going to get some fan translation treated, treatment or a guide online, things like that. Another option is while I did say like Dojin games and things are ending up on Steam, there are still a lot of these games that do not make it out here in the West. Um, particularly, I would focus on like, or I, I kind of focus on like the hobbyist games, things that are not really ever intended to be released outside of Japan in any way possible. Like, some dude made this game and is selling it at like a convention like this in Japan on CDRs or like a you know card, you know those kind of things. This is right here is like Ghost Nine Solid, which is like a cool almost like Cave Story esque Super Paper Mario kind of game where you can like switch the perspective. It's it's really neat. Um, but like as far as I'm aware, you cannot buy this game digitally online anywhere. You just happen to either have be there or if you're like Suragaya, it's like an online web store, you can buy some of these as well. So these are two particularly like niche things if you're into retro games, if you're into like these Dojin games. However, there are still like modern platforms where you might still run into this issue as well. So um, sometimes it's just like a little game that maybe somebody can't really find much of a reason to bring over. Um, I'm gonna hopefully not uh, brutalize this name. Uh, it's called Fururiki 4, I believe. And I'm gonna stress I have not played this game yet, but it's like a, um, a motorcycle game, um, but it's like a vacation motorcycle game, not like a racing one. So you're going around Japan, going to all these sightseeing locations, but you're not playing this like in a 3D world. It is all full motion video. Somebody recorded a camera on the front of their motorcycle driving down the road, and you're going between different locations. And when you get to the location, it's like a Google map thing where you like jump from point to point. And there's like, they put like characters in the world with dialogue and things like that. And like, that's really cool. But like, is that going to sell here? I don't blame. I think it's Nippon Ichi Software. I don't blame them for bringing it over. It's like a very specific thing. Uh, and this is the fourth entry. It's, I think the first one's on the PlayStation, but uh, neat. Um, 
And then also, this is, I feel like, less so these days, um, but sometimes you just have a really big publisher with a really tiny game. Um, one of my favorite Nintendo Switch games right now is a game called Buddy Mission Bond. I adore this game. It is about, like, basically this cop who is going around with a, like, band of misfits uh, taking down, like, a criminal organization that's, like, brainwashing people. But the artist, like, the Ice Shield 21 artist, super flashy, like, really intense scenes using, like, still art, like, you know, shaking around and everything. And it's just really cool. And this is a Nintendo-published game, and it was released a year ago, and they haven't said anything about bringing it over. Um, and there's the recent Nintendo Direct, and they still didn't mention it there. And I, I don't blame them, but and I would love for this to come over. I just feel like it's probably not ever going to. So even though it's like a very text-heavy game, it is entirely text and voice acting and things like that, um, I've, I've had a really great time with this title, despite very, very, very little Japanese knowledge on my side. So those are just some examples of where you might need to apply this today kind of thing. Um, so the types of challenges we'll be talking about are largely going to be, you know, we're not going to be talking about games where you can just punch to get through, right? If you pick up a Japanese beat em up, you can press start on the title screen, you're going to get through it, right? Go to the end. Um, we're going to be talking about games that are going to have challenges with, uh, you know, compl like complicated uh, progression requirements. So, you know, you go to the king and he's like, I need to go find Sir Raphael somewhere. You don't know that. It's all in Japanese. You're like, what am I going to do about this? Um, yeah, I, the king stopped talking to me and now I'm just in the town. Um, so things like that. Um, we're also going to talk about games with like unfamiliar game mechanics. Um, so basically, you know, this may be a game that has a unique um, set of gameplay to it. Um, it may just be something really foreign, like, you know, it may have a long history in Japan, but there are very few of the games came out over here. Um, like, I still feel like, it, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like, like the more traditional like dating sim kind of thing with like all the stat oriented stuff, I feel like that stuff still really hasn't come over here all that much. Um, and so it still is hard for people to kind of approach them, especially if they can't read it. Um, and then also games with a reliance on dialogue and story. Like I said, Buddy Mission Bond, almost entirely text-based and things like that. So trying to get some appreciation out of that. So there are kind of three major approaches you can do to this. And I would say you want to kind of, if you can do all of these, do all of them. It's going to help you the most. Um, but you know, it may not be ideal for your setup or things like that. Um, the easiest thing to do is just straight up like using your own eyes and ears and really paying attention to the game. Um, you know, you're going to be kind of like compensating for the fact you can't read things and really pay attention to like little minute details in the world. Um, I used to do this pretty, pretty frequently a long time ago. And while you can definitely get through a game this way, um, I think like the, what you get out of a game can often be fairly limited. But it's the easiest thing to just like pop a game in, turn it on, go, you're ready um, kind of thing. Um, it is also probably the most difficult one to, to do in my opinion. The other option is just doing some research ahead of time, like going online, see what resources are available there. Um, and, you know, trying to just learn about the characters, the world, the setting, the gameplay mechanics as much as you can before you get in so you're best prepared before you actually start a game. And then also utilizing a variety of tools so you can actually get as much information as you can, not only out of the game itself, but also out of um, the, the, the resources you're going to find because we're going to talk a little bit about Japanese resources and things like that too. So. Before we even do this, though, one thing you should always check for. Make sure there's not a fan translation for your game already made. If it's in English, play it in English, please. It's just going to make it easier for you in your life. I mean, I'm not saying you can play in Japanese. I've played Japanese games that are in English. But if you are just like, I just want to play this video game, and you have no other like, you know, thing you're trying to do other than that, just do that. Um, maybe ask if you even need to play the game. Um, maybe you can find somebody who's played it online and like has done like a online translation while they're translating while they're playing through it, or maybe they have like text on screen that translates it. You know, that's going to be severely limited by their Japanese level and things like that. But as an option, if you, you know, if that is what you're looking at of game, and then also if you really don't need to even watch a game, maybe just like watch somebody's video about it if someone has a video. So just just a heads up because the things we're going to be doing today are not particularly like the fun part of playing a video game at times. So. So like I said, I want to start with the options that are more about just using your own eyes and ears. And the first thing I always need to stress is that you really need to make sure the game is your full attention. It's very easy to like listen to a podcast while you're playing a game, play, like watch something on the side. You need to be, you know, phoned in on that game and watching that exactly. Um, what you can do with this um, in, in terms of this approach of like literally just pulling what you can you know, out of the game without any help. Um, one big thing to do is like really, really listen to voice acting if your game has voice acting. 
Um, there's a lot of helpful things voice acting can do for you. You're going to be incredibly tempted to be like, I don't understand any of this. I'm going to smash this button all the way through this cutscene so I can get past this as quick as possible. Don't do that. Um, you need to sit down, listen, and you know, try to pull things like you know, as simple as just like the emotion somebody has in a scene based off how they're saying things, how characters interact with each other. You can kind of learn what a character dynamic is between multiple characters that way. Um, and just like a general demeanor of a character based off how they're speaking, things like that. You can get some general ideas of like what a character is like in that regard. Um, another thing you really should do is watch the animations in the game. If your game is like a full 3D video, video game, like really watch the body language they try to convey to you in that as well. You know, make sure you, you are like dissecting every little thing they do, everything they're interacting with in the environment. Even for games where you have character portraits where they're just in there with like a face that's, you know, yapping away. Um, if there's a change of emotion, things like that. So, you know, again, these are pretty straightforward things. I just want to give you guys the stuff up front that is the like easiest to get into if you really want to get into this. Um, also, another thing you can do is uh, really track what you're doing in a game. Like, really keep note of your actions. So, it's really again tempting to kind of like smash through a game, just click on random things, just smash through it, and not know what you're doing. Um, you really want to pay attention to menus. Like, really click on a menu item. Really ask yourself, what's in that menu? What am I getting to? You know, pay attention to if you have like an item in like an RPG you're using, are those in the same spot every time? And if they're not, like look at the description of the item, see if you can kind of memorize like a part of that text. Does it say 40 in it? Maybe that means it means recovers 40 HP or something like that, right? Just so you can come back and more easily later on kind of pick those different things out of the, uh, the inventory itself. Another thing is that you want to look for changes in the environment. And so this is, again, kind of as I mentioned earlier with like the whole thing with like the king being like, go find Sir Raphael and you're not really knowing. This is something that would be conveyed to you in text typically. Um, and it wouldn't be too un uncommon for you to, to, after a game like that, or after that, even in English, to like say, OK, I need to go look for what's different in the environment itself. But really, the big thing is that you're not going to know what's different in the environment, right? So you need to really dissect like every NPC's location go through every dialogue option they have. You know, if you talk to them and they only have one dialogue option earlier, and then you talk to them and they have eight dialogue options later, you really need to take note of that because that could mean you either progress in the story or that person is progressing you in the story. You know, selecting yes, no, things like that. And last, also, if you can, test your theories. Make a lot of save files. And if you've done something and you think this is how something works, go back and just make sure that's how it works. So like, for example, if you enter a room, there's a locked door and everything in there, go to another room, interact with a bunch of things in there, come back, the door's unlocked. You know, you need to really ask, okay, what actually unlocked that door? And if you know, you know, you can think of like what is suspicious of what you did to, to unlock that door, then you can go back to that previous save, go test that, come back, see if the door's open. And that can be really helpful later on in the game. You know, something like a door is maybe not so much the case, but if you have like a puzzle, you know, that kind of progresses throughout the game and gets more challenging, understanding what you did to solve that puzzle you know, the first time is going to be a big help when you come back and try to approach it later on as well. Kind of get back to voice acting a little bit. Voice acting can also be like super helpful um, for some things. So while you're listening to it, um, one thing you can do is listen for loner words. Please, there you go. Thank you. Um, so loner words, um, you know, like any other language, you know, Japanese gets English, you know, mixed into it, you know, over, over time. That's just how it happens. So for example, on screen here, um, we have a game called Team Innocent. It's like a sci-fi Resident Evil game. You have an operator that kind of talks you through things as you go through it. Um, and one little text that will be of note here is this little bit here. This is something called katakana. I'm not 100% sure, but basically I believe for the most part, katakana is almost exclusively used for like foreign words. Um, but you know, if you see this text, um, if you know this text, then, then you would see that. But you know, as somebody who doesn't know Japanese, what you're really listening for is what they're saying during, during this voice acting. So this text here, that you're seeing on screen, even though it's Japanese characters, literally just says like main computer. So when the voice actor says it, they're just gonna say main computer. So like it's a little messed up from pronunciation, main computer. But the point of this is like, well, okay, she said main computer. This probably means, means I need to go back to the main computer room or something like that, right? So really listening for those things. And sometimes depending on how it's spelled out in Japanese, they can be harder to kind of understand than others. Um, so it's a little iffy, but it is a big help. And again, one of those reasons why you need to really be listening during a cutscene, even if you can't really understand anything that's happening. So another thing I want to point out with like these foreign, or loan words is that you, you want to make sure you're not tricked by them. For example, there's the Japanese word pan. You might know what this means already, but you know, if you don't, you're like, oh man, I need to go find a, a pan in the environment somewhere. 
I, I'm going to go to the kitchen and look for this pan. No, pan means, uh, or pond means uh, uh, bread. There's a bread man. Um, and I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I believe it comes from the word pau in Portuguese. I don't know for sure. But you know, just keep in mind, all, all katakana words are um, um, borrowed from English, right? Um, I will say, if, if you do want to do anything, you know, if you want to learn any Japanese at all, learning the katakana alphabet can be a really big help because a lot of things in Japanese and the menus and things like that are often just English words written in Japanese text. So if you learn that alphabet, it's like, okay, I can find the pistol in the inventory because it's literally just labeled pistol just in Japanese characters, basically. So you don't have to do that, but I'm just saying, a little extra credit work if you want to. Oh, bread man, go away. All right, <laughs> research. So this is where I really think you start, like, like, like I mentioned, with the, with the stuff I mentioned before, that is stuff that can really get you started, but I feel like it's really challenging to play a game that way. Um, so with research, this is really helpful um, because the more you can get about a game ahead of time, the lot easier it is to actually sit in and really start to um, interact with the game, understand what the characters are doing and things like that. So first and foremost, always remember, check for English language resources first, look online. Depending on when your game came out and how you know, popular it was, you may find like there's an English guide online that can walk you through, so it can help you with things like progression and things like that, or character summaries, those kind of things. You can even find like partial guides, like item guides that have you know, descriptions of how items in the game work. So always try to grab as much of that stuff as you can. I think that, yeah, there we go. Um, and then also maybe just read over some online discourse and, and analysis of a game. This is not super reliable because chances are people talking about this game also don't know Japanese. So it's like, okay, take it with a grain of salt. But it is a good place to like look and get some ideas of maybe, you know, what to think about before you're jumping into a game in terms of like, okay, what kind of gameplay mechanic is this? How does this work? And then how can I kind of play around this once I get into a game? Things like that. So depending on the game and how popular it is, you may find English resources online. You may absolutely not. And then you'll be like, OK, well, this is me. I'm the only man in America who's looked for this, apparently. Um, so I'm going to dig into this. Um, so a big help is looking at Japanese resources online. Um, so first and foremost, you know, just keep in mind Japanese game names are not the same as American game names. Um, so what you can do to find a Japanese game name is go to like Wikipedia or Moby Games, and sometimes they'll have the Japanese name for the game on there. You can then use that to search for other things online. Um, I, one thing I should specify is that you do want to use the Japanese characters, not how it's written out in English. So when you go to Wikipedia, you're going to be on the English page, and it's going to say Sega Densetsu 2, which is like Secret of Mana. Uh, that's Super Nintendo game, Secret of Mana. So Sega Densetsu 2 is the Japanese name. No, what you want on the, is on the left there. So if you go to like the Japanese Wikipedia, change the language to Japanese, then you can go ahead and uh, copy that from there. And you can see there's like these little Tetris brackets that show up on the sides of them that basically kind of signifies a title of something. So the very start of a Wikipedia article, article look for those little Tetris bra brackets. It's going to be a big help. Yes? It may be the qu quotations. I don't remember. <laughs> but yes, the little Tetris looking pieces there. <laughs> I can say that much at least. Um, so it, it may be quotations for that. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so Sigma send that. Uh, another thing you can do in research, or so, so what you can do with this once you have that text is, um, you know, if you're already playing a game, a Japanese playthrough can be a big help for you kind of dissecting some of those things we mentioned earlier, helping you get past the pain point in a game. I have no idea what's happening at this point in the game, who I need to go talk to, go find somebody who's played online and skip forward to that point, see what they do. Same thing with like game mechanics and things like that. Really watching videos can only really help you with so much. I feel like it's good for like a quick like band-aid thing if you're already playing a game. But it's maybe not the best option for like you know doing research ahead of time and, and, and like watching somebody play through an entire game before you even play it, which seems a bit much, right? Um, so the other thing you can look into are like Japanese wikis and then also like Japanese walkthroughs called uh, capture guides and things like that. Now you might be saying, oh, if I could read Japanese, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so one thing you can rely on for these Japanese wikis and capture guides that kind of um, give you full details on a game typically. I find capture guards seem to be more like 100%ing a game, but I could be wrong about that. That seems general. Um, is machine translation. Now, machine translation is a dirty word for a lot of reasons. You know, if you don't know, Google Translate, uh, DeepL, anyone come up there? Boop, 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 boop. Google Translate, DeepL. Um, so, Google Translate and, and DeepL, um, these are handy tools, but they are not reliable translations. So, never use these in sensitive situations, talking to people online. It, you can kind of use them, but you, you got to be super, 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 super careful. Just don't usually, if you, if you don't know how to, think a lot about it. 
Um, also, like translating text for some anyone in like a very sensitive information. Again, just not very liable. However, we're playing video games, so it's cool. Um, using them key is the right thing with machine translation, things like that. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about you know how you can utilize these. Also, talk a little bit about the problems you can run into to machine translation. Um, so, I want to show you two examples. First one, just kind of give you an idea of what can go wrong. Um, first, uh, my favorite Switch video game right now, Buddy Mission Bond. This is Buddy Mission Bond. Again, a bunch of talking portrait character heads in this game, so largely text-based. Um, so this is a scene in this game. You have Luke on the right here. He's an American cop. And then on the left, you have Mokuma. He's making a weird face there. But he is a um, Japanese ninja. So when you go to essentially the game's Japan land or whatever, it's not really Japan, but you know what is it, themed after it, uh, Mokuma's like, you need to try all this food, Luke. And this scene happens multiple times throughout the game. So, so he's like, here, try this. Luke's like, mmm, mogu, 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 chew, chew noise for eating things. And then he is ecstatic. He is like, oh, this is delicious. This is great. Um, if you know Japanese in the audience right now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to make a very bad attempt at translating this real quick, but it's just going to serve our purposes for today, OK? So don't take this as exact. Um, so essentially, what, what Luke is doing right here is he's saying, like, the, the English equivalent of saying, like, delicious. It's delicious kind of thing, right? So he is like exclaiming it, catches himself off guard from like the, the exclaiming it, and then says like the sentence, right? Um, so the word he's using here is like umai, which is like one of the Japanese words for delicious that you can use. But at the beginning of the text here, he says uma and cuts himself off. So in the same way we say delit at that beginning thing, he cuts himself off. Um, and uma in Japanese means horse. So machine translation is just like horse, it's delicious. So every single time Luke eats anything in the game, he's just exclaiming, horse is great. So, you know, if you don't know what's going on here, you might be like, man, Luke really likes some horse right now. Um, but, you know, you can kind of figure things out. Like, hey, this doesn't really look like horse probably, right? Like, you probably know something's going on there. So you can kind of pick out where those weird things kind of come into play. So that's just like a fun, goofy little thing that I, I think is probably my favorite example of that happening. Um, just because it's kind of somewhat harmless, but you know, it is, it is kind of fun. All right, how do you actually use this though? Um, I'm going to talk about a game that I'm actually making a video about right now called uh, Nintendoji. It's like an isometric kind of uh, strategy, or I guess dungeon crawler. You're like this priest who walks around and you go from grid place to grid place to like, you know, it's basically navigate around enemies and find treasure. And the enemies are like invisible on this grid. So there's like certain squares that they exist away from you. And so a lot of this game is utilizing spells to cast at enemies to either defeat them, move them, get around them yourself, things like that. So I have this one spell as an example here. This is actually on the Japanese wiki. Somebody in Japan was very kind to write up descriptions for every one of these spells on the wiki, or at least copy them from game, one or the other. Um, so thank you, whoever that was. Um, but you know, you can kind of Google translate this text. And it says, hey, and this is going to be a train wreck, but attacks the soil attribute on a variant, the variants being the name of the enemy in this game for some reason, according to Google Translate, um, of one square within three squares around. So that's kind of a mess of a sentence. It says attacks the soil attribute on a variant, which means, you know, that could mean it's attacking the earth attribute effect on an enemy, um, which is kind of weird. You know, one, within one square, so maybe the enemy like occupies one square within three squares around. All right, I agree. That's not super helpful. But damage is doubled in the case of the variant of a wind attribute. Um, so, what, like taking that information I have, you know, knowing video games, earth and wind are typically dynamically opposed. So this is probably actually an earth spell we're casting is what's happening, and we're attacking an enemy within three squares. Um, so then you can kind of take this information. You know, it's kind of a mess, but you have some idea of what's potentially happening here, right? And then you can kind of go ahead and um, test this in the game, which you might say is like, why didn't you just do that in the first place? In the case of a game like Nintendoji. You can throw spells all you want, and the game won't like stop you from doing it. So if you throw it and like have no idea what it's doing, it just wastes your spell, and that's it. It's like okay, congratulations, you got rid of it. Um, so you know it's, it's something you can go and test in game and see if it works and, and things like that. Um, another thing you should also do, and, and I don't know if there's ways you can plug this into browsers automatically now, but DeepL is a little bit better at machine translating this stuff. The text for this spell specifically actually comes out really nice. It says. An Earth attribute attack is performed on the single Xenomorph within three surrounding squares. The damage is doubled if the Xenomorph is wind-based. So it calls enemy Xenomorph for some reason. But you know, largely that is you know, what we kind of deciphered from the text of the Google Translate, right? Um, and so you know, I don't want to give you a lot of false confidence in deep elf. Depending on the complexity of the sentence, it's going to be bad. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's just another resource for you to use if you want to use it and you know, trying to pull what you can 
out of that text, essentially. Again, not reliable, but you can use it to kind of lead you to the right place for that. So the one great thing about these two different resources is that they are already like, you know, like going through like a Japanese wiki or, or going through like a, a guide online is that the text is already on the website. And when you drop in a machine translation, it knows what the text is and everything. And it's going to be as accurate as it can be given what it has, right? Um, so there are other resources that you might want to look into as well uh, in addition. And that can be direct resources like the manuals themselves that the game come with if it's an older game. Um, if you want to buy a Japanese guide, a Japanese guidebook can have information in there too. Um, and also heads up, Japanese guides, like especially older ones, definitely have like a lot of really cool art in them usually. So it's worth maybe getting it even if you're not going to use it. Just think about it. It might be cool. Um, <laughs> But um, when you're using these, uh, you know, you can't just dr drop the text in directly. So there are like camera translation apps you can use. I use Google Translate on my phone. Again, not super reliable, but you can get some information out of a manual that way. Just snap a picture of the, you know, manual, take a picture of the page on the, on the, the, the uh, manual, and then it'll go ahead and try to automatically translate that. You also can like scan it and then try to run it into like a PC image translator. I haven't had a lot of luck with that. I just find that most PC image translation tools seem to be less reliable for some reason, but you know, Good on you if you can figure that out. I actually do a combination of these things. I scan the manual and then it blow it up so it's like easier for the tr camera tool to actually read and then do it from there, which is kind of a weird thing, but you can do it that day. Um, the other thing you can also do is use the actual in-game text as well. Um, so in the games itself, you can go ahead and try to machine translate that in-game text. There's a few different ways you can do that. Um, there are uh, basically, like I think I mentioned to you earlier about the PC emulators, you can kind of embed essentially what is the equivalent of a camera translation app into that, and it'll go ahead and look at the screen, try to find Japanese characters, and try to translate that, right? Um, and it'll try to go ahead and pull that information out. Um, and then you can also um, use something, I don't remember the exact tool name, but you can also have like a screen watching software where you can kind of you know, specify a window on the screen, and it will go ahead and try to translate anything it finds within there. Those are also really finicky and require a lot of like, you know, setting like, adjustments. And so I haven't had a lot of luck with those, but they are out there if you want to try that. That's specifically helpful for like modern PC games that aren't running like an emulator or something like that. You're just running them natively on your PC. Um, I do something maybe a little crude. Um, so I just, I have a little desk set up that I play games at, uh, at. So I just use camera translations for the games themselves. So I use, you know, like makeup YouTubers, they got their little stands with the camera connect, or their, their stands with the uh, phone that they connect to it so they can do their makeup on stream. I bought one of those. And then I just twist it to the side and point it at the screen. And then you can go ahead and set Google Translate to like a, a real-time translation mode. Um, this is a nightmare when it comes to text coming out of it. But again, if you get the little pieces, it helps you. And with this way, you can play on like real hardware for consoles and things like that, right? Um, so you can go ahead and pull uh, that. But here's like on screen here, we have a great example of why this is terrible. Um, this is a game called uh, Angelique. I think at least this is Angelique Special. It's one of the Angelique games um, on there. And I have no idea what the text is saying there, I will say on the top. But the translation tool says, original cuckoo -cu -cu swastika. The, ch the cheeks fall. It's delicious. And like, that's not, that's probably not, this is a game about princesses and the sky castle. Probably not about swastikas in this game. So, you know, just an example of, you know, how that can go bad. You know, there are some text boxes that you just look at, and you're like, this is a mess. I'm just skipping past this one and hoping I'm not missing anything important, basically. Um, you know, when you do it this way, I would say probably like 40 to 50% of the text is useful. Some of it's not. So you have to do a lot of filling in the blanks yourself with this kind of stuff. So anyways, um, so that's kind of the major approaches I take. Again, you kind of take and choose what you need out of it. If you don't get what you need out of those things, there are some like last result or last yeah, uh, last options you have essentially. Um, a is you're if you're using one particular tool that you research, like if you found a wiki that's like really great for an entire game, just make sure that that if you're like how many holes that you're having in that. If you look to make sure the other resources you have don't fill those holes anyway. I had a fighting game I was playing, and there was one English language resource I had that was great for like special moves and things like that but it didn't talk about the defensive part of the game at all, like how you defend enemy attacks, which might, I won't get into the fighting game. It's a complicated fighting game, but it is a pretty extensive defensive system in the game, essentially. Um, and, and I had to go and like look at the manual and machine translate the manual. And then once I looked through there, I was like, okay, I know how this works. And I was able to play the game to its fullest extent, not just you know using whatever special moves the game had. 
Other thing is like, hey, man, sometimes you can just brute force it and interact with literally everything on screen. Click every, talk to every person on screen, choose every dialogue box. If you're playing a game like a dating like game or something like that, where you have to worry about characters' relationships with you, make a save file first before you do this, just to make sure you can roll back. Because you know, depending on what you choose, it might destroy a route you have with a character, things like that. So if you ever get into this situation, I just recommend kind of setting a pinpoint where you're like, OK, I can come back here if I need to kind of thing. And lastly is maybe just take a break for a little while. Um, you know, when you're doing this kind of stuff, it's, it's, again, like I said, it's not particularly the fun part of playing a video game when you're doing this part. It's when you're actually understanding a game that's a, it's, it's fun. Um, so when you're doing all these other things, you know, it's not great. And depending on how complex the game is and how dense it is, you know, you may have to do this stuff more than often and it may get really frustrating. And depending on the type of person you are, you might just start becoming blind to a lot of things. Again, being able to perceive as much as you possibly can is a big deal if you're going to do this. So make sure if you're, if you're, you're feeling hot-headed or something, just take a step back. But you need to have a plan to come back. The big thing with this is you have to commit. If you're not like, committed to it, it's gonna, you know, you're not going to be able to get through it, unfortunately. Um, but hey, you know, if some people, if, if it's not fun enough, then that's perfectly fine. Like, I totally understand. Most people play video games to have fun and have a good time, not suffer. <laughs> so, so I totally understand that. Um, and then, you know, the last thing to keep in mind in doing this is like, hey, sometimes it's not always going to work out for you. And sometimes that doesn't mean just like not being able to beat a video game. I can't think of a single game I've played in Japanese that I have not been able to beat as long as I've committed to it. Like I, I've beaten every single one I've wanted to. But what I have failed in is like properly understanding the story, properly understanding the game mechanics. Like maybe I just did something to kind of like work my way by. And it's really one of those things you have to kind of keep checking yourself across the way to make sure like, am I am I actually interacting with this game in a way that's going to, you know, make it satisfying by the end? Because sometimes it's easy to just let yourself kind of like pass by a section just because you're, you know, tired of dealing with it. But you really need to make sure you're, you're interacting with it so you have that full and as much enjoyment as you can have, I guess just to say. Um, because at the end of the day, like, again, learning Japanese is going to be your best bet for this kind of thing. But here are the tools to help you if you just want to get through one game, if you don't have the time to get through a Japanese or learn Japanese, those kind of things like that. So that's pretty much the end of my presentation here. Um, I will take questions here in a second, but just sort of a reminder, again, I'm with the website OneControlBar.com with the YouTube channel. Um, if you are curious about Japanese games and you look at all the stuff I said today, and you're like, wow, I don't want to do any of this, but I am interested in these games, um, I do talk about these games pretty often on the channel. So if you want to come check that out, I have cards over there if you want to take one when we're all finished up here. Um, but yeah. Otherwise, uh, that's all I got. Any questions? I'll, I'll try to hear you. I know I had a little trouble hearing you earlier, but yeah, go ahead. I actually don't know if it's on uh, 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 mobile. It's something I need to look into. The big reason I've stuck with Google Translate is um, because it has that real-time translation mode for that. And I, I, I believe I've tried some other tools, and unfortunately, they just don't have that real-time translation mode. Because how I play games, I just kind of want to like have it set up there, and then I just want to be interacting with the game and not really having to mess around with like taking screenshots and only like taking pictures at particular times. Now, it depends on the game, like depending on how much text there is. If it's mostly an action game, but there's like some text elements I needed to interact with at some point, um, or like an adventure game, like I most of the time I'm just doing like a dungeon, like a Zelda style game, right? But then we actually talk to someone you need it. Then I might do something that's a little more like just take a picture of the screen and then put it, my phone down. But in that particular case, I, I'm, I've relied on Google Translate, unfortunately, so far. But um, I need to look into that. Thank you for appreciating for permission that. <laughs> Any other questions right now? No? no. All right, and I'll let you guys go. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. Again, you can come and get a card if you want to.